Welcome to Counseling Conversations with Lone Star College Online, where we are dedicated to giving students the tools they need to maximize their potential and reach their goals. When students feel their best, they do their best. So let's talk. I'm Tamara Harrod, and today we're going to be talking about student success tips and strategies that are useful for all students, but specifically those students with ADHD or ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, or just any student who may have issues with focusing, getting distracted easily, time management issues, or procrastination. ADHD varies in severity and the impact it has on your education. Knowing how it impacts you and incorporating multiple strategies to improve your chances for success is the way to go. So today I'm excited to welcome Jillian Mahler, one of our speech communication professors. Hi, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm excited to share a little bit about myself and my story with you all and our amazing students. So I am Professor Jillian Mahler. I am a full-time speech professor at Lone Star College Online. I actually started at Lone Star Sci-Fair many years ago as actually a part of my dream. I had been what you would call a late bloomer. I didn't even start college till I was 22 years old and it took me a little while to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, but when I started teaching high school, I knew that teaching was my passion and my calling and it's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so from there, I went on to complete my master's degree and started my dream job at Lone Star. That's awesome. So you are familiar with ADHD. What are the common signs and symptoms? I actually consider myself to be more familiar with the signs and symptoms of women with ADHD. And the reason is because I grew up in a time when ADHD was not a disease that was diagnosed in girls. Um, it was all about being hyperactive and bouncing off the walls but that wasn't me. Even though I had tons of signs and symptoms, it wasn't something that was automatically recognized because of a lot of stereotypes and misunderstandings within the greater medical community. So when looking at what my particular symptoms were and how they really um, developed into more complicated issues um, starts really with one of the biggest symptoms for me was talking excessively. And um, this is something that my family actually has funny stories about going all the way back to kindergarten. Um, and that has been something that's been a problem for me because it also led to some impulsive behaviors. And one of the things that singled me out negatively um, was my impulsive interrupting. I had a very hard time holding back when in conversation and in the classroom. And I was the one who was always sitting like this, you know, call on me. Mm -hmm. And um, that got me a lot of negative attention. But as I grew into an adult, and I do want to clarify, I was not diagnosed until I was an adult. Um, I had already developed some impulsive behaviors and um, that included overeating and excessive spending. Um, another problem for me is daydreaming. Even though my mind is constantly going a million miles per hour and I'm always thinking of multiple things, I, for me, it's like my computer screen. When I've got when, um, my internet open, it's like every tab that I, I may have so many tabs that I can't even tell what they are. And that's what my brain is like all the time. I mean, it was always easy for me to make friends because I'm very outgoing, but I really had a hard time keeping friends because I'm very forgetful. Um, object permanence is always very difficult for me as well, and that includes people. So if I don't see you frequently or if I don't talk to you every day, um, I kind of forget. And that's really hard for people to want to continue friendships with, with people who struggle in that way. And I think um, the most challenging thing for me overall uh, was the fear of rejection, which really now is being called rejection dysphoria. And um, I didn't handle it the way that neurotypical, um, my neurotypical peers did. When there was any kind of re rejection, like if I, I was the last to get picked for kickball or something like that, um, it was devastating for me. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things together, because I wasn't getting the help and 
um, the support that I needed, I developed some anxiety and some anger issues. Um, so I'm very impatient and that kind of goes along with that brain constantly going. So, um, gosh, this is almost like <laughs> vulnerable to admit, but driving, I get angry when people don't, you know, flow at the speed of traffic and um, follow the, those rules that are pretty rigid for me. So um, I, I some anxiety, some anger, and um, sadly, some very pretty big struggles with self-esteem. Well, thank you for sharing that. So uh, tell me a little bit more about your experience with ADHD um, and how it impacted your education and career. Well, like I shared, it took me a longer time um, than most to get an ADHD diagnosis, but I'm seeing that more frequently now um, through social media and other advocacy groups that there's a lot of people like me who are really getting finally diagnosed. Um, but because that it, it did take so long for me, um, I, I struggled a lot with my education. Like I said earlier, I didn't even start college until I was 22. And some of that was because I didn't believe that I belonged. I didn't think that I was smart enough to be in college. Even though I had the intelligence, I really struggled with the executive functioning, um, like procrastination. Um, for some reason, this brain up here loves to wait until the last minute. And then it puts this profound amount of stress when you're trying to write a 10 page research paper the night before it's due not the best strategy, but I didn't have any other strategies or skills at that time. And so um, I had signed up for a couple of classes here and there, dropped them. And then at that point, I was like, yeah, college is just not the right choice for me. Um, but I did get the opportunity to start college um, when I was 22. And this was after having my oldest child and um, from there, I was able to find some people to help me develop some skills and really was able to be successful from there. Now, for me, and medication has been a very important part of my toolbox. It's not necessarily the case for anyone. And I don't believe that it's my place to tell anyone um, that that is the right that that is the right choice for them. But it was the right choice for me. I also chose to include neurofeedback therapy. And I work with mentors who have helped me develop some of those executive functioning skills that I really didn't develop at a neurotypical time um, during my adolescence. Wow. So thanks for sharing that. It sounds like you were able to incorporate several strategies to combat those issues that you were having. So let's get into some of those practical tips that you suggest students use. Um, for example, what are some time management tips you would suggest for students? So um, I'm actually going to expand this a little bit and say I actually recommend this for my colleagues, too. Yeah. There's a lot of us who are neurodiverse in this amazing academic community. So the things that I have are not just for my students. It's also for my um, my oh, colleagues, too. Cool. So <laughs> I think that um, the most important thing is to establish an ideal and realistic routine based on your needs of when you study best or when you work best. Um, I'm not a morning person. I've tried really hard to be a morning person, but one thing I know about my neurodiversity is that I'm dopamine deficient. And so when I get up in the morning, those neurotransmitters are really low and it's hard for me to get going. So scheduling classes at eight o'clock in the morning was not a good choice for me. And scheduling to teach classes at eight o'clock in the morning was not a good choice for me. So I really strongly suggest that you develop a very specific schedule. And this is absolutely critical if you're an online student because you don't have that necessary retire, uh, required time that you have to show up at class. Just like as an online professor, I do not have a required time that I have to show up to work. But for us who are neurodivergent, that can get pretty messy pretty fast. So make sure that you literally schedule your study sessions. If you're taking history and speech and math, you can put an hour a day 
Monday through Friday, or you can do two hours for each. And let's say you do schoolwork for six hours on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's where it comes in knowing how you work best and what is going to be realistic for you. I also think that everyone needs to have planners. So Stephen Covey's work, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, many years ago, as all these digital tools were coming out, was really starting to talk about the impact of a digital planner versus a paper planner. And I found that I didn't understand why the digital planner didn't work great for me. And like Stephen Covey was saying, oh yeah, this is it. This is the way to go. But whenever I did that, I seemed to fall short. And I'll even tell you, I missed a meeting last week because it was in my digital planner. Now I did find one called the Kazi app and I love this app because it allows me to actually schedule all the important things, not just for my work life, but also for my family life. So doctor's appointments, football games for my kids, um, payments that I have to make, all of that can be scheduled and it'll send me a reminder. That's what I use it for specifically is, hey, Jillian, guess what? You have this appointment tomorrow at 9 a.m. But um, I actually have it right here, so I'll show you. Um, I am also a paper planner person and I have decided to make it something creative and fun. So I use all sorts of like markers and highlighters and stickers because it gives me that dopamine release that makes me feel happy. And then I'm more motivated to actually use my planner rather than letting it sit there. So just a little side note, a lot of people don't know this, unless you've taken speech with me, you know this because I've told you. Using a checklist, whenever we actually have a physical checklist that we cross off with a pencil or a pen, that actually gives us a dopamine release. Mm -hmm. And that is that neurotransmitter that so many of us neurodivergents are lacking in. We don't, our, our bodies don't naturally make enough of it. And so this, when you have that checklist and you can say, I, I did this, then your brain goes, yes, you did. And then you're more excited and motivated to do the next thing. So that's my favorite thing is to sit down and say, I did it, I did it, and check those things off the list. Now, this is a big one and this is hard and I don't want to pretend that I have this figured out because I don't. I'm working on a really big project right now and designing a new class and I'm trying to really master this and that project myself. But it, it's really a process that we call chunking. And if you mm -hmm. receive any accommodations as um, like in K through 12, this was probably one of your accommodations. And chunking is when you take big assignments and you literally chunk them into small pieces. So let's say you have a paper or even for my class, you have a speech. If you want to procrastinate, which is what a lot of us do, um, then you're gonna have to have all of those steps done in one short period of time. And that is the opposite of chunking. So chunking would be like if you have that paper, so you break down day one, you choose what your topic is. Day two, you write your thesis. Day three, you locate your research. Day four, you rewrite your thesis based on what your research found, moving all the way through to submitting your final draft. Now, a lot of people, this is such a concept that um, is, is not very familiar for students. And I do want to add something in if this is okay. Um, one of the things that we've also found in research, and I know I shared this with you before in emails. Um, if you are a student or a human who grew up in a poverty situation, we know now from research that the impact that growing up in poverty has on your brain mm -hmm. is the exact same as if you had um, ADHD or sometimes even an autism diagnosis and how that impacts your executive functioning. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't have ADHD, but you grew up in, in a mindset of scarcity. There wasn't enough food um, and uh, not enough time, not enough resources, money, housing, all of those things that can actually impact you in the same way that ADHD impacts me. And so this tool is just as powerful because it's probably not a part of your existing framework. So don't wait until Sunday when your paper is due, Monday before, 
starts and you do one piece at a time, one small piece in each chunk that you cross off your list gives you that dopamine release and you feel even more motivated. But not that just that, you are going to produce better quality work at a lower level of stress. And that just helps everyone. I love all of those tips. That was wonderful. I hope the students take those and practice those and use them and see what works best. I am also a paper planner, just like you. <laughs> um, but I also need to check out that app that you mentioned, um, because I'm currently telling my students to set alarms on their phones as reminders to stick to help them stick to their ideal weekly schedule. So maybe that app is something that I introduce to them, too. So that's that's a, a great tip. So what are some organizational strategies you would recommend for students who um, to stay on track with studying and their busy schedules? Absolutely. So again, um, I, I think this is something that everyone can benefit from, not just ADHD, because we live in such a fast paced society. And with all of our um, technology, we have information coming at us constantly, and this can make us feel overwhelmed to the point where sometimes we just kind of shut down because there's so much going on. And so getting organized with a busy schedule is something that everyone benefits from. Um, first of all, I would say, just like I said in the previous answer, make sure that you're dividing or chunking your assignments and in your work so that you're not trying to um, build Rome in a day, right? You've got to do a little bit at a time. I really strongly recommend no more than 30 minutes per session. Um, so for me, that's 30 minutes is a long time for my brain to focus on something. Um, I will actually set a timer on my phone that says, okay, you know, and I tell myself, I've got this, I can do this, and I'm going to sit down and work for 30 minutes. Then I'll get up and take a five or 10 minute break and um, take a walk, if, even if it's just around my house, run a load of laundry, but something where I can just take a deep breath and take that break. And breaks are one of the most powerful tools for me in managing my ADHD because we can also hyper-focus. And when we hyper-focus on something, then we let some of the other things that need to get done go to the wayside. So breaks actually help with that as well. Um, if you are medicated, choose your work time when your medication is most effective. Now, um, my next dose of medication is due in about 30 minutes. And it's funny as we're even talking, I'm like, okay, my brain's wanting to go squirrel over here, just like it's doing right now. Um, so trying to make the most of your study sessions if you're on medication. Um, some students who are not on medication by choice, which is okay, you do you, no judgment. And some not by choice, um, insurance and resources are just not there. Mm -hmm. We know that for our amazing brains, caffeine can actually have the same effect. So sometimes having a cup of coffee or um, even a cup of hot tea or an iced tea can help you um, in your study sessions and being able to focus. Now, I know you're probably not going to like what I have to say now, or at least the students won't, because um, I do have a college age ADHD um, child and uh, she does not like this at all, but sleep. Sleep and nutrition are so incredibly important when you're neurodiverse. Um, sleep hygiene is, is critical. And I did not take care of myself in terms of my sleep for a long time. I um, mean, it had a negative impact on my health. It lowered my immune system. Um, I was not fully rested, even though I was sleeping some because I wasn't keeping this, this um, cyclical rhythm, the circadian rhythm, and I wasn't working with my body's natural sleep rhythm and cycle. It, I was just chronically exhausted. So turn off your phone, your screens, any of those blue light things two hours before you need to go to sleep and prioritize sleep because our bodies were designed to rest and we need that rest when, and regardless if you're neurodivergent or not. 
Um, and then think about study tools that you find useful because this is a very personal thing. Um, so like flashcards are an example of a study tool. Flashcards do not work for me personally, but they work for a ton of people. Now, I found that I work best and I am most successful when I connect with other human beings in my learning environment. If you're going to school face to face, then that is like, hey, can I have your phone number? If you're in an online class, that is using offline resources to connect with your classmates. In online college, to be successful, you cannot look at it as learning in a vacuum. You're in a community, which means commune. It comes from that root of us doing life together. So as a learning community, we can use things like WhatsApp, group me remind or you can even just start like a text messaging thread over the summer i had a, a class section and they decided to set up a group me i didn't want to be a part of it because i respected their autonomy and their needs for privacy and sometimes even to just vent but i will let you know that 90 percent of the students in that class passed with a b or higher so the last one, and this is, I'm going to give you two types of it. Um, so as a Lone Star student, everyone who attends Lone Star gets a free OneDrive. And if you're not comfortable using that, the other version is the Google Drive. It kind of functions in the same way. Save all of your work from your entire college career on a Google Drive. If you're in an online class and you're writing discussion posts, write it in a Google Doc, copy and paste it into your discussion board. When you're researching, save all your citations and even just your notes from the citations because maybe that source is gonna bring you to another source for another assignment later on in the future. Um, and so when it comes time to prepare for a project or a portfolio or some kind of exam, all of your resources are located in one place. And I cannot even begin to tell you, now this dates myself, but when I did this, Tamara, I actually had to save everything on a disc. Um, so, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so um, be so grateful because those online drives are an incredible tool for you um, and take advantage of them if you can. Those are some awesome yeah. tips. And I'm so glad that you mentioned sleep and nutrition, because I agree 100%. Without sleep, it's like nothing else works, right? And without proper nutrition and an emphasis on whole foods, um, you can even reduce your symptoms by having good nutrition. So ideally, good sleep, yes. good nutrition definitely are at the top two. So what would you tell students who have procrastination issues, students who tend to put hard tasks off until the last minute? The first thing I always say is you're not alone. So this is an area where I, I see my students really beat themselves up a lot um, and feel as though um, they're, they're broken or they're there's something wrong with them because they can't seem to pass, get past this procrastination habit. Um, so I'm going to tell you, you're not alone. Uh, it is common for students to procrastinate. And it's even more common when you're neurodivergent because the way that the, that human beings, we just work um, is we want to get the maximum results from the least amount of effort. And we also have a tendency to put off things that we enjoy to, uh, or that we don't enjoy um, to do them last. So we do the things that give us that dopamine, make us happy. We do those first, and then we do the other stuff last. And then sometimes we do it so far last, it's like literally we've given ourselves no time. So I have two things that I have used in my personal life. I don't say I have used, I should say I use daily. <laughs> um, and it's called, the first one is called first things first. And this is prioritizing things by what must be done, what needs to be done and what you want to do. And so um, 
I'm going to confess something, but I need all of my students who are watching this. You cannot tell my boss, okay? Like what happens in Mahler's class stays in Mahler's class. So I love building online courses. Like if my boss said, hey, yeah, just go for it. You can do that all day long. I'd probably work like 100 hours a week. Now, grading, not so much. I don't like grading. Remember going back to that rejection dysphoria thing where I don't handle rejection very well? The opposite side of that is I don't like handing out rejection. And it makes me it makes me sad when I know somebody has put their heart and soul into something and, and it just didn't meet the expectations. So I tend to put grading off because I love my students so much. I don't ever like to give bad grades. Um, but guess what? I'm a teacher and I have to grade. So um, it has to be done. It's one of those things that must be done in order for me to fulfill the requirements for my job. Um, so I'm also weird because I also love to clean house. And when we started working from home in COVID, when all the restrictions first hit, um, I really was challenged because I would start cleaning house and then I would look at my watch and it was like, wait, what do you mean? I haven't even worked yet. I've been cleaning all day. And because it gives me that dopamine release, right? So somebody, my husband comes home from work and he's like, wow, the house looks amazing. Oh, that compliment feels so good. That feels so much better than grading. But grading stacks up, then I'm completely overwhelmed. Then I don't feel good physically because that stress is starting to affect my body, then I'm not sleeping as well because I'm stressed. And then I'm probably overeating and eating junk because I'm really stressed. And then I have just gotten myself into a really bad situation. So now in this calendar right here, all of my grading, it's the first thing. You'll find it on my top three list every day. Um, and if I get towards Friday and I've already finished all my grading for the week, then it's like I get to celebrate early and add in one of those things that I need to do or something that I just want to do, like work on a course design. But when we get those things done that, we've, that we don't want to do, but we know we have to do, we feel such a sense of accomplishment that we actually are more motivated. So it is going to be a little bit counterintuitive first, right? Like, why do I have to do the stuff I don't want to do, but I have to do? Because then you're going to feel great about yourself knowing that you got the tough stuff done. And then you're going to be more likely to continue with that pattern. Um, and then the second thing is actually a psychology tip and trick. And this is called pairing. So it's pairing something you like to do with something you don't like to do. Um, so I told y'all that I don't like grading. Shh, again, it's our secret. Um, but you know what I do like is candy corn. I'm a unicorn. Yes, I'm one of those weirdos who loves candy corn. So I also love gummy bears, but during the fall, it's candy corn. And that sits here on my desk. So once I sit down with my 30-minute timer ready to go with my grading and I'm rocking and rolling it, I give myself a little treat. And so I'm pairing something I love with something I don't love. And that's telling my brain that, hey, this isn't so bad after all. And so that is a great trick or tip that you can use. Um, and you can also use this in all areas of your life. Um, exercise, not one of my favorite things to do. Wish it was, but it's not. Uh, what I do love, though, is audiobooks. So I've paired those things together. I listen to my audiobooks when I go for a walk at night. And then that's a win-win in both situations. So um, you want to first things first and pairing, and that's really going to help you break that cycle of procrastination. That's a great reward system. I hope that students and employ your coworkers use that for sure. Um, so any other tips to being a successful college student? And um, so there's tons, um, but I'm going to just give you a few here. <laughs> One is if you have ADHD, please do reach out to disability services. And um, there's no shame in being neurodiverse. There should be no shame. This is just a part of your story who makes you amazing person you are. And so I, I would really love to see our students just remove that element of shame. And it's okay to say, um, I need help. 
just like when my daughter broke her arm, um, she couldn't do all the things that she had done before, like opening jars and such was hard. So she needed a, a help with that. And there was nothing wrong with that. So for us, asking for that help is very important. Um, I want you also, I want all of my students to pursue higher education for yourself. Sit down and think about the why. Why are you doing this? Why are you here? It needs to be for you. It needs to be for exploring a passion that you want to pursue. And so when we're doing college classes for the wrong reasons or because somebody else wants us to do it or because we're trying to make someone else happy, then it's going to be a struggle. But you can take the time to tap into what is your why? Why are you here? Whenever my students, we meet in virtual office hours when um, students are struggling with whatever it may be, the course concepts, um, but it's, it's usually things like time management, procrastination, um, self-esteem. I have a lot of students who struggle with discussion boards because they're afraid that their peers are going to think they're not smart enough. The first question I always ask them is, what is your why? Why are you in college? And a lot of my students, it's to make my mom proud, um, to make my, my daughter proud, to get out of the cycle of poverty. And all those things are incredibly powerful. But I, I want you to do it for you because you are worthy of pursuing a dream that matters to you. Also, start small. Um, it is okay to take a class or two until you have mastered all of the techniques to help you with your neurodiversity. When I started college at 22, I started with one class and I made an A. And then I made, and it was, um, it was hard, but I did it. And then I moved to my second semester and I took two classes and I made an A and a B. And then after that, I went on and I took 12 to 15 hours per semester and I was able to graduate with honors after a very rough high school and late start in college. Also choose a major that truly interests you. Um, this is gonna increase your motivation to do the work I think a lot of students struggle with having to take some of those core classes that they might not be interested in, but you can take core classes as an opportunity to explore your degree plan or your program or um, your major and, and how that class applies to your major. So this was a strategy that I actually used in college was I would stop and think, okay, I'm probably gonna make somebody mad by saying this, but I don't like math. It's just not my jam. It's not my favorite thing. And with the ADHD and studying, it was like, and it, I just felt like I was doing the same thing over and over. And then when they put letters and numbers together, that really threw my brain off. But then I would stop and think, well, wait a second, how is math gonna impact me as a teacher? I have to do a grade book, so I have to know how percentages work and I have to know how to, um, you know, create grade books that make sense, not just to my brain, but also to my students. So it's finding like, how can I use the skills in this class towards something that I really want to do? Um, yeah, you're going to have to take some basics that you're not super interested in. That's that's. But here's the thing. All of the classes that are in our core are designed to help you be an amazing member of our greater community, not just the Lone Star community, but the Tomball, the Montgomery, the Cypher, you know, all of those smaller communities and um, to be prepared and engaged. And so all of these classes are going to benefit you. And then the last thing is something that very few students actually want to do. Tamara, do you think you could guess what that might be? Hmm, I don't know talk to your professors. Yes. We chose this job because we love what we do. This is not something, um, and I can tell you, especially with Lone Star College, it is a pretty intense process to work here. And so um, we all want to be here because this is an amazing place to learn. It's an amazing place to work. 
but we love our students. We care about you. We want you to succeed. We're not people sitting behind the computer grading like this, which is easy to think when you're in an online class and you're not seeing that person literally in front of your face. But I tell my students in the first couple of weeks, I'm like, okay, whenever you get an email from me, I want you to see this because that's what I'm doing. I don't even grade if I'm in a bad mood, right? Because I want you to get the best of me, but I also want to get the best of you. And that includes us having some kind of conversation and relationship and understanding of who you are, what you want, what you need, and how I can be the best professor for you in this process. So please talk to us, include us in your experience because we don't want you to go through this learning process alone. So true, especially in the online environment. Make sure you're reaching out to your professors, so important. So in your opinion, what is the most important takeaway? Um, I shared a little bit in the beginning how it, my self-esteem was just really crushed um, by my experience as a neurodivergent. And I think I'm probably going to get emotional. <laughs> I want you to know that you are not broken. Divergent does not mean broken. Divergent means different. I love the way Tula's father in the original, uh, my, big frat, my Big Fat Greek Wedding, at the very end of the movie, he is explaining the differences between the two cultures with an analogy. And I actually um, wrote it down, so I'm going to read it to y'all. He says, you know, the root of the word Miller is a Greek word. Miller comes from the Greek word Milo, which means apple. So there you go. As many of you know, our name, Portakalos, it comes from the Greek word portakali, which means orange. So, okay, here tonight we have apples and oranges. We are all different, but in the end, we are all roots. So apples are not any better or less than oranges. They're just different. Some people prefer apples, but that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the orange. And some people prefer oranges and vice versa. I'm kind of more of the kiwi. Nobody really knows how to get the fruit out of it, but some people really love it. And some people really don't, but that's okay because you're a fruit and I'm a fruit and Tamara, you're a fruit. We're just all fruits. Yeah, we're different but nobody is less than because of their neurodivergence. You're not broken, you are worthy, and you do belong at Lone Star College. Well, thank you, Jillian. You are amazing. Your, prof your students are so lucky to have you as their professor. So thank you for being here with me today. You shared a lot of great tips and strategies that I know is going to help set students up for success. So thank you. Thank you. All this right. Great. Yes. All right. Well, if you would like to discuss more student success tips, learn how to reach out to disability services, as Jillian mentioned, or other topics, make a counseling appointment and let's talk.